And tonight I want to hear from you. I'm going to give a speech out there in a little while, but tonight, right, right here, I want to hear uh, from you. We'll talk about anything uh, that people want to talk about. I'm uh, very interested in what's going on in terms of the working conditions facing farm workers, uh, how the environment and climate change is impacting uh, the economy here. I'm interested in, uh, in criminal justice issues, the role of the police, uh, interested about access to health care, whether people are getting the health care that they need, obviously interested about issues like immigration reform. Uh, so those are some of the issues and the other issues you have. Um, and you'll throw them out. So, why don't we, Bill, how are we going to proceed? Senator, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Bill Velasquez. I'm the National Director of Latino Outreach for this general. And we're honored to be here today in Bakersfield. So, what we've set up for the program is uh, we have uh, three panelists who are reflective of the community who each would like to make a statement, a brief statement, and then ask you a question, Senator. And if you could uh, answer the question after each panelist, it, it would go smoother. And then if there's time, we would definitely want to go out to the audience and get their questions. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Lorena Lara. She is an immigration activist and organizer here in the community of Bakersfield. And uh, she would like to give you a statement of question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, like Bill mentioned, my name is Lorena Lara. I'm a community organizer with Faith in Action Green County. Uh, we're larger of a larger network called Pico National. Um, my question is a little bit long, so I'm going to be reading off my cell phone, excuse me. Uh, so over the last seven years, uh, over two million people have been deported and Congress has failed to pass any positive changes in immigration policy to help the 11 million undocumented immigrants living in this country. Instead, detention and deportation of our community has increased. Here in Bakersfield, as well as other, other parts of the Central Valley, we have sheriff departments who collaborate closely with Immigration and Customs Enforcement and have gone so far as to have ICE agents stationed outside the county jails. We have also seen the uh, proliferation of private companies profiting off our communities through detention centers like the one we have here called Mesa Verde, which is owned by GEO Group, the second largest private uh, detention facility uh, owner. Uh, so my question is, Senator Sanders, as president, what will you do to end the deportation machine that has devastated the lives of farm workers and millions of other undocumented immigrants in our communities? Good, very good question. Uh, number one, I've introduced legislation to end uh, corporate ownership of prisons and detention centers. <laughs> I don't think it is a good idea for private companies to be making money through the imprisonment of people in this country. It encourages more, pris more prisoners, and that's not what we want to do. Um, we will also, obviously, uh, fight for comprehensive immigration reform. Um, with 11 million undocumented people in this country, it is very clear to me we have a broken immigration system and we need comprehensive immigration reform and a path toward citizenship. Uh, the, goal, the goal of my immigration policies will be to unite families, not to divide families, which means that we will also end the current deportation of policies that currently exist. I disagree with President Obama on that. Joy Williams, who is uh, an organizer for Faith in Action and uh, executive director, and uh, is doing a lot of work recently on misconduct of uh, police officials. Joey? Senator Sanders, I want to welcome you to Kern County, to Baker Show, taking the time to be here. I heard recently on one of your debates I was watching that you support 21st Century Policing Task Force recommendations outlined under the President's uh, commission. 21st century policing calls for transparency, accountability, and building trust. Here in Kern, Faith in Action, many members of Faith in Action are here, have worked tirelessly for um, 
this to be implemented. Kern County was identified by The Guardian in December as having the most officer-involved shootings, killings per capita in the United States. Police have investigated themselves and are often investigated by their own fellow officers on these shootings. I have sat with many family members, and some of them are here today, who have been victims um, of these, uh, who have been victims of these shootings, the family members, uh, to, to, due to these policies. Senator Sanders, if you're elected president of the United States, will you support a full implementation of 21st century policing, providing accountability, independent investigation of officers using deadly force, implicit bias training involving procedural justice between officers and communities of color, and if elected as president in November, would you or senior staff come back here in early 2017 to work with us in the community to make sure this is implemented? Thank you. Very good question. I think most of Americans recognize that we have a criminal justice system today which is broken. What do I mean by that? I mean that we have more people in jail in this country today than any other country on earth. 2.2 million people who are spending $80 billion a year lock up 2.2 million people. So a lot of factors involved in that. So number one, what I would say to you, I'm going to do my best in terms of criminal justice to make sure that we end that international disgrace. I would rather invest in jobs and education for young people rather than more jails and incarceration. So we want to keep you quiet. <laughs> Too many kids in this country hanging around without jobs and not in school, and when that happens, they get into trouble. But to get to your questions, which are excellent questions. I was a mayor. I don't know if anybody here has ever been to Vermont. Anybody been to Vermont? Okay, it's the other end of the world. But uh, <laughs> um, And I was a mayor there for eight years in Burlington, Vermont and I work very closely with our police department. And I've worked with police departments all over the country and on law enforcement issues. The vast majority of police officers in this country are honest and hardworking people, and they have a very difficult job. But to your point, we have got to establish a culture in this country where it is very clear that like any other public official, if a police officer breaks the law, that officer must be held accountable. Number two. I think that gets to your second point, or another of your points. It is not good enough to have police officers investigating other police officers. When there is a killing by a police officer, when somebody is killed, under my administration, that will immediately initiate a Federal Department of Justice investigation. <laughs> Number three, what we have got to do is develop a culture, which exists in many other countries around the world, by the way, that lethal force, the killing of somebody, is the last response, not the first response. There are ways, you know, a policeman's job is not easy. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen fights where policemen have had to go in there and break it up. It is not easy. People are drunk, people are whatever. But what the culture should be is that we do everything that we can possibly to end the problem without using lethal force. Now sometimes, you know, somebody comes running in here with a machine gun. You know what? We want lethal force. But to the degree that we can resolve that problem, lethal force should be the last response, not um, the first response. Uh, we need also, uh, as I you know, mentioned a moment ago, uh, to uh, demilitarize police departments. Uh, police departments, a good police department, and there are many in America, are departments where, they are peop where the police are trusted by the community, so that the community goes to them when there's a problem. You want people to be able to go to a police officer and say, you know what, they're drug dealers down there, and feel confident that the police are going to be working with you, and there are many departments like that. We do not want police departments to look like occupying armies or to be terrifying the people in their own communities. Other point that I would make is that we want police departments to reflect the diversity 
of the communities they serve. You know? People feel more comfortable uh, in those circumstances. So there are a lot of issues uh, related to criminal justice reform. These are issues very important to me. Uh, and yes, I would be very happy to visit you after our president. Next up is uh, Caroline Farrell. Yeah! Woo! Slightly well known here. Uh, she's an environmental justice advocate in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, she's here as an individual, but you all know her as the executive director of the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. Woo! And she works predominantly with farm worker communities here in uh, Kern and, and nearby counties. So, Caroline, could you please ask your question? Thank you, Senator Sanders, for coming. Uh, we love it when, when actively engaged political leadership comes to Kern County, so thank you very much. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley contributes more than half to California's $47 billion agricultural economy, get 24% of the valley's population live in poverty. Uh, it's a region that's often compared to Appalachia. Uh, the ag sector uh, is one of the driving forces of the economy in the Kern County, and it often is exempted from environmental laws, immigration laws, and employment laws. And this has led to a lot of the economic and environmental burdens that the region faces. Everything from high unemployment, low wage labor, to some of the worst air quality in the nation. Climate change and its impacts are going to have to change the way the region's economy operates. Um, and whether those changes are going to benefit farm workers and other adversely impacted communities is largely going to depend on the leadership that's in power during this time of transition. And my question for you, Senator, is what will you do as president to help farm workers and other impacted residents navigate this transition and prosper along with everyone else? Um, you are looking at a member of the United States Senate who was in the House for 16 years and the Senate for 9 years. I don't believe that there is any member of the Congress who has been there as long as I have, who has a strong pro-labor record. And that, that's not just a very high uh, voting record. I've been on more picket lines than I can recall. Uh, I was... Anybody here know uh, where Immokalee, Florida is, what Immokalee, Florida is? Okay. Immokalee, Florida is a small town near Naples, Florida, where they grow a lot of the tomatoes that are used by uh, McDonald's and the other fast food uh, uh, franchises. And I went there uh, about 10 years ago, 9 or 10 years ago, to take a first-hand look at what conditions were. And I want to find out more about conditions here. Well, conditions were uh, on the uh, farms uh, for the uh, tomato workers, and they were deplorable. When I got there, just coincidentally, when I got there, the U.S. attorney had arrested a contractor, farm worker contractor, for slavery. Slavery. Because he was holding people in involuntary servitude forcing people to work against their will in America 10 years ago. Uh, people there, their working conditions were awful. They didn't get, they would go out into the fields, they would have to wait there for hours, didn't get paid for that. Uh, the housing that they worked in was deplorable. You had a bunch of people sharing really wretched housing. Uh, healthcare virtually not accessible. Uh, we worked with those workers, by the way, had a hearing in Washington uh, with the late Ted Kennedy, and we actually ended up improving the situation there. We ended up getting those workers better wages and better working conditions. So I believe that farm workers should not be exempt from labor law. Uh, and in fact, in terms of labor law, let me be very clear. Uh, I have campaigned uh, from the day I began for a $15 an hour minimum wage. 
and for pay equity for women, so that women do not make seventy nine cents on the dollar compared to men. And when we talk about health care access, and I want to hear from you and, and from the people in the audience about those issues, uh, the United States must join the rest of the industrialized world and guarantee health care to all people as a right. I want everybody, regardless of their income, to be able to get quality health care. With regard to environmental issues, I have introduced the most comprehensive climate change legislation ever introduced. So let us be clear, this is not good news, but it is true. Uh, I know that Donald Trump does not believe that climate change is real. But all of the scientists believe that climate change is real. And I mean, trust the scientists just a little bit more than Donald Trump. And uh, what that means is that we're going to have to transform our energy system away from fossil fuel into energy efficiency and into sustainable energies like wind and solar and geothermal. And when we do that, I believe we can create many millions of good paying jobs. Also, I am very concerned. I was in another part of California where the same issue arose. We got to take a hard look at what pesticides are doing to agricultural workers. What pesticides do to the quality of the water that we drink. But we need a lot more work to protect people who are doing some of the most important and difficult work. You know, we were driving in from Santa Maria. And I've never been in this part of the world before. Unbelievable. I mean, it really is. I, I probably went through a part of California which is bigger than the state of Vermont. It is. <laughs> so I mean, the amount of uh, agricultural land um, that we saw is unbelievable. The amount of workers that we saw. So uh, we are going to take, and I, you know, I want to hear from you about what you see the problems are. Uh, but there's no question we will do our best to end the kind of exploitation that farm workers uh, are now experiencing. And, and lastly, let me say that you know, when we talk about poverty and people working for inadequate wages, don't believe that it is just here. It may be bad here, but it is all over this country. Uh, 47 million people are living in poverty. Millions of people are working for nine or 10 bucks an hour, uh, and you can't live on nine or $10 an hour. People don't have health care. people's the educational opportunity for the children in many parts of this country is absolutely uh, inadequate. And I think the main point that I would make to you is that it is time to end a government which represents the 1%. And let's elect a government which represents the 99%. Thank you. Thank you. If it's okay, if it's okay, what I would like to do is I'm here not to give you the speech comes later, but I want to learn from you and be honest and be frank. Um, tell me what is going on uh, with farm workers, what kind of lives people are experiencing, uh, what are the problems uh, that people are saying. We don't have a whole lot of time, so. We, we have a microphone in the audience. Uh, hands up for people want to get. Okay. Are you the mic guy? Okay, we have a young lady right here. Why don't you stand up? Okay. Yeah. Right here. Mike, that Thank you for being here, Senator Sanders. Welcome to the San Joaquin Valley. I was born in Mexico and came to this country when I was three, and I'm actually a little further north in Fresno, so I'll see you there tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I am a daughter of a farm worker family. My father turned 53 yesterday and can barely walk. My dad has been working in the field since he was 15 when he immigrated to this country and has been working and is still working there today, and it's 92 degrees outside. So the work continues. Um, a lot of the issues that, are, that farm workers continue to face is exposure to pesticides. We continue to see the issue. We continue to see the contamination of our groundwater. We have some of the worst... Okay, let me ask you a question. Our exposure to pesticides. So, what? Their faces are in the pesticide. They're inhaling that stuff. Is that what's going on? Yes. All right. And do we see 
illness as a result of that? We do. We what? see some of the worst, worst health outcomes. We see people exposed. We see people having children with birth defects. We see issues with cardiovascular disease. We see people contract asthma. We have some of the highest asthma rates in the country. We continue to see these issues continue to be prevalent. And not only are we seeing issues with pesticide exposure and farm workers are being told to get back in the fields and work within minutes, within hours of this field being sprayed, but we're also seeing continued groundwater contamination. It is not a legacy issue. The drought did not make things worse. We didn't make, wake up today and see that the drought had made things worse. This is an issue that continues to happen. The drought made water, groundwater quality worse. Many of our communities can't drink from their tap and are paying twice for water. We also have dilapidated housing, no affordable housing opportunities. In Kern County today, we need at least close to 30,000 affordable housing units to meet the need because we cannot make that happen. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> and I want to stay on some of the issues. Veronica, I want to stay on some of the issues Veronica raised. Let's stay on pesticides and human illness. People working in the fields getting ill from pesticides. Who wants to talk about that? Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Senator Sanders. My name is Deandra Senator Castro, and I think part of the, the challenge is that not only are farm workers and others being exposed to pesticides and other contaminants, but what make, to make matters worse, they're being denied access to health care. Just last year in Fresno County, we had to fight against our County Board of Supervisors because they were removing the only safety net program that allowed undocumented residents access to primary and uh, specialty care. And we see that across our valley where farm workers and other low-income people who are not eligible for under the Affordable Care Act are being denied access to basic life-saving care. Okay, let me ask you a question. Uh, I worked very hard uh, during the passage of the Affordable Care Act to greatly expand community health centers. Do you have any community health centers in this area? We do have community health centers. And they, by the way, take anybody who walks in the door. Yes, they do. The challenge is that our community health centers are at capacity. Okay. And, the, and, and what made it worse is by cutting our, the medically indigent services program, we then created a shortage of access points for undocumented okay. folks to access health care. And the most important piece of that is that federally qualified health centers only provide primary care access. The challenge here is specialty right. care. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, Stay on pesticides. Health care and water for the moment. Gentlemen over there, please. Uh, hi, Sanders. I'd like to thank you for coming. And um, I'm pretty sure we'd all love to take a nap for you right now. You look pretty tired. But uh, my question for you is um, when it comes to pesticides and houses, you know, schools that go around fields, they're affected. You know, um, there's a pattern of the people that live in the houses closer to the fields get cancer at a rate that's much higher. Here in Kern County, I think it's like. Um, one of the highest cancer rates and it's projected to double in 10 years. So um, what I'd like to know is, you know, there's elementary schools filled with minority children and houses filled with minority communities. Uh, what can we do, not just for the workers, but for the people that are just outliers affected by the pesticides? It goes without saying, um, you know, that if a product is being used which causes cancer, you don't use that product. I mean, that's not a... I, I don't think that's a very difficult conclusion uh, to, to reach. Um, have there been uh, health studies in the area, uh, independent health studies documenting the kinds of illnesses uh, or the kind of clusters that, uh, that might suggest the relationship between pesticide and illness? Are we aware of that? Yes, sir. I'll get to you uh, next. Yeah, sir. Senator Sanders. Uh, a few years back, like 25, 30 years ago, Cesar Chavez conducted uh, uh, with his pesticide task force a whole series of investigations as to why the cancer clusters were uh, being initiated here in Kern County. McFarland, Delano, Early Mart, all of these little tiny rural communities. And what they found was a whole macro bay of, uh, of obstacles to get to the root of, of how this was being connected to the health of the children. Children were being stillborn, they were dying uh, as soon as, uh, right after they are born without limbs and things. And one of the biggest single things that they found was the seepage of the nitrates into the water and the contamination that ensued. But, they, but the, the big corporations, uh, the big corporations of Monsanto's and, and others that were uh, into the chemical and the petroleum business, 
continuously would, uh, would, would interfere with the invest investigations, and of course they would pay for their medical right. opinions. And it just became, and it's, to this day that exists. You will not find uh, uh, the adequate information to be able to pin it on these guys. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, that gentleman, blue shirt. Good afternoon. Uh, Senator, uh, I've been feeling the burn for a long time, and I'm very nervous about it. Uh, Don't be nervous. My name is Gustavo, I'm a junior. Today is Saturday, so I'm not working, but during the week, I am the project coordinator for Central California Environmental Justice Network, and when we do, we have a community-based reporting network where community members are able to report to us an infinite amount of problems. Something that we've seen a lot same within the pesticide realm is that communities have always reported to us buffer zones of where contractors and rancheros and, and big industrial farms are applying pesticides near their homes and near schools, right? And so we've, we've gained a big relationship with the uh, local current uh, uh, ag commissioners, and it seems like their unwillingness to act on these issues and to protect communities of minority communities of color is not a big is not a big problem. Recently, we had one of their inspectors say, "Well, we don't want to bother the farmer too much with the with the farm workers' issues, right?" And so we these are issues that need to be addressed, and they talk about bigger environmental justice issues in, in rural communities in rural California. I have spent my entire life taking on corporations like Monsanto. Right. And, you know, we run into Monsanto and other large biotech companies in many, many areas. For example, uh, just a, a little bit different I issue is that I believe that there should be labeling uh, on the food products that you use. Whether they GMOs or whatnot. Of course, we've had to fight Monsanto uh, on that, but my state did pass for that legislation, by the way. Um, you know, I think as the gentleman here said, and, and as you said, uh, you know, we are taking on large corporations who make billions of dollars a year, have all kinds of lawyers, all kinds of press agents, and they do whatever they can to try to suppress the truth. You all remember, you know, because I'm older than most of you, but you know, a long time ago, the tobacco industry spent billions of dollars trying to convince the American people that smoking was good for you. you know, they had doctors on television saying, I smoke this, it's really good. All right. right now, as we speak today, you have Exxon Mobil and large fossil fuel industries pouring millions of dollars into phony organizations which they have established trying to deny the reality of climate change. And what you're seeing here, what I'm hearing here, is you have these other corporations we're trying to deny that their products or the way they grow their food are causing very severe human illness. Not to do. That's what these guys always do. They live under greed and all they want to do is make as much money as they can and if people get sick or exploited or die, that is not their concern. And that is the culture that we have got to change in this country from top to bottom. We can grow food in this country that is healthy. We can do it in a way where workers are treated with dignity and respect and earn a decent wage. We can do that. But we can't do it unless you have a president and a Congress prepared to stand up to these large corporations. All right. Now, what about, let's, let's, I want to get to the water issue now. All right, tell me about water, drinking water. Let me get to some new, all right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Susana de Anda, thank you for coming, Senator Bernie. I believe clean water is a basic human right and it should not be a privilege. Every year, Californianos are exposed to illegal and unsafe levels of contaminants found in their drinking water. Over one million Californianos each year. And the vast majority of folks are found here in the valley exposed to that toxic water. We're talking about nitrate, 1, 2, 3, TCP, DVCP, uranium, perchlorate things you do not want to have in your drinking water. And it's important that people understand their drinking water because we're paying twice for water for a toxic bill, and on top of that, having to buy bottled water like we have here to avoid becoming sick. It's unfortunate that we have this reality. 
California passed a bill, AB 685, the human right to water, very indicative of the, of the conditions we're facing in California. So I'm here to tell you, as our future president, if you become, please ensure that all Californianos in the entire United States have access to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water. We're tired of pollution. We won't stand up for that anymore. Thank you. Thank you. I want to stay on. I want to stay on board. People tell me of personal experiences or experiences they know of what is that is unhealthy. Gentlemen, way to back down, right there. Abuela, I didn't want to. Bernie, uh, welcome to Curry County, to Bakersfield. Uh, my name is Juan Flores. I'm a community organizer for the Center on Race, Poverty, and Environment. And water pollution is a big issue here in Curry County. Uh, we are living on a drought. And the oil companies, through fracking, are polluting our drinking water. There's actually water wells right now that we could usually that we could use uh, to, say, uh, to to kind of uh, lower the drought uh, and help ourselves. And we're not able to use it because the oil companies have contaminated with the produced water that they use on fracking. Ninety-eight percent of fracking happens here in Kern County, and they're killing us little by little. Thank you. All right, water, water on water. You want to speak to water? Gentlemen over here. Yes, sir. Yeah, about water. Uh, throughout the valley, we have a lot of uh, rural communities. A good example is the community of Army that is not in compliance right now. People cannot drink the water from, uh, you know, the, the uh, taps. They have to pay for that. Uh, well, say that again. People cannot drink the water from their tap. Correct because uh, of all those contaminants that are unhealthy for people, uh, you know, it's uh, we're not... Let me ask you this, how many people are we talking about who cannot drink tap water? In that, in just that community, it's 20,000, but that is just 20, one. Oh, 20,000 20, people? Yes. Correct. Yes. And no one debates that you can't drink, that you're told that the tap water is unhealthy. 20,000 people? In just one community. You know what? I don't think anybody in America knows this stuff. Yeah, and it's just, uh, just an example, you know, but you can go throughout the valley and there is contamination everywhere by pesticides, by fracking, by lack right, of uh, responsibility okay, for me ask this. So yes. I am living on one of these 20,000 people and I can't drink my tap water, yes? All right. What do I do for water? You need to buy. You need to buy from uh, you know uh, bottled waters uh, to be a little bit safer. <laughs> but if uh, we need to do, uh, we, if you can want to do something when you become your president, we need to take care of that because you know we cannot live without water. And are people still forced to pay their basic water bill even though they can't drink water? Correct. <laughs> All right. What is the minimum? What might you pay? Um, I live in Tehachapi. Hi, Senator Sanders. Um, so I'm sending a mom of three kids. I live in Tehachapi. So Tehachapi is east of here um, in the mountains. And where I live, um, it's in Cummings Valley. We have not been able to drink the water since um, October. Um, so obviously, I'm a single mom, three kids. You've talked about poverty, and we have to well, buy bottled water. Well, how do you get by without? You have to buy bottled water. So that's and a pretty still, expensive proposition. Well, I mean, it, it, it gets expensive for the bottled water, but it, if anything, I mean, it's truly a complete inconvenience. I mean, it, it, having to remember to go and buy water. Um, but at my house, I am still charged the base rate, even if I never touch the water or turn it on, forty-seven fifty a month. Uh, I drink? assume people have raised this issue that they don't want to pay a fee for water they can't drink. Yeah. And what is the response? <laughs> so that... They claim us all the leaflets. One of our board of supervisors, uh, Mr. Mendez, you know, he even tried to force a lady to sit down because she was complaining and representing this community that they don't have no water carrier. And they pay $120, $120 a month. And they cannot even take the water. And so you, you take a shower there, Mr. Senator, 
It's terrible. I mean, we got the problem all over the world. What do you mean bottom. it's terrible? Your body was, was... Yeah, I mean, you know, you, I think you, you are more clean by not taking the shower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. I was in Flint, Michigan a few months ago. And you all know the story of Flint, Michigan, where children are poisoned by lead in the water. And I think what I am learning, and I think the American people haven't learned it yet, is that this water crisis goes a lot beyond Flint, Michigan. Um, I think, and what they're doing in Flint, which seems to me to be sensible, but if I were here in this community, the idea of having to pay a basic fee, was it 47 minimum before you use a drop? You know, it's people should not be paying for poison water. Uh, and in fact, you know, you should ask for a rebate uh, from the day that you stopped being able to use the water. I mean, that would seem to me to be the sensible and fair thing. Okay, we got a hand right uh, here. Yes, sir. Whew, I'm nervous. Uh, uh, don't be nervous. Uh, um, first of all, I just want to tell you, uh, Senator Sanders, that uh, uh, we're doing all the work that we can to, to definitely, you're going to win Central California. Yeah. Um, I have, a, have a, my delegates are right here, so they're going to be in Philadelphia and they're going to be hooting and hollering for you. And also I want to tell you that um, I grew up in the United Farm Worker Movement. Uh, I know maybe they didn't invite you to go someplace, but the movement was not a particular family, it's been everybody. I know there's people right here that probably were involved in it too. Um, I know David Villarino I used to be his bodyguard when I was four years old. And, um, absolutely. So, and my dad as well. So you have plenty of representation from farm workers and you have representation also from a United States Navy veteran as well. And you also have a representation that someone that who grew up here, who's seen, so seen their dad work, Till um, forever, but he gave me the motivation to go to college, to make a difference, to become a physician, to do everything that I can, because that's what we're doing now. We're working 24 hours. You're leading in the polls, and you're going to be leading even more. Because guess what? You inspire us. You put that fire. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing it because guess what? You talk about the issues that all of us care about. Okay? And that stuff that we did before, that we, someone, I don't know what happened, but guess what? We're tired of it. There's plenty of water issues. There's plenty of pesticide issues. There's plenty of issues that lack health care. There's plenty of issues that you definitely put your foot on as far as passing 15.1 million dollars for a United States veteran with the post 9-11 bill. Everything that provided those opportunities because guess what? They went there and they, and they defended the nation. Now, I've seen plenty of issues where we've posted, like in countries in Haiti, where the United States Navy had potable <coughs> water systems developed there. Well, why the heck can we have them here in the United States of America? the scandals, um, you know, one of the things you learn when you run for president, which is an extraordinary experience, by the way, because you meet so many beautiful people, like the people in this room today. Well, thank you. Like all is that people don't know. Nobody in America knows what you just told me, the 20,000 people. Well, more, than, more than that. Nobody knows that. Million, but how many? Can I turn on the attack? Nobody knows that. And that has a lot to do with media, with media reports. You know, we talk about corporations, it's the same business. But I, I think what I, I, I'm trying to say in your presentation, you know, touch me is that most of the people in this country are good people and are decent people. 
Nobody that I know thinks that a worker should get sick because he's working around pesticides. And nobody that I know thinks that somebody should pay $50 a month for water when you can't drink that water. Or well, nobody in America even knows that there are millions of people who turn on the tap water and they can't drink it. How in God's name are we not holding the people accountable for that? <laughs> you can't go around poisoning people. You know, somebody came in here with a bat and hit somebody in the head, the police would arrest them. Well, if somebody is poisoning the children, that person should be indicted as well. We cannot continue to do that. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Yo soy de este, Oaxaca, soy indocumentado, este, soy de aquí, eh, represento a la, a, a la comunidad inmigrante que trabaja en el campo y quiero decir que, uh, que usted como senador este, que está aquí en, este, en los Estados Unidos, uh, quiero que nos ayude a, a, a reforzar las leyes uh, con las compañías porque muchas partes uh, nos dan agua así sucias, que tienen dos tres días entonces este yo como representante representante del, de la región triqui de los indocumentados que estoy aquí ahorita mm, quiero hacer un recordatorio a usted que se estabilice bien las leyes para que nos den aguas limpias uh, my name is um, Jose. I'm also a Trique from Oaxaca, Mexico. I'm one of the undocumented farm workers that's here. And I'm just simply asking you to please uh, reinforce the laws that are out there because there's a lot of abuse that's going on in the fields. We are one of the largest populations working in the fields right now that are, tend to be abused because of the language barriers, because of the documents. So we're asking you please to enforce those laws so that we can basically work decently. Okay, Jose, thank you for the question. I want to Let's stay on that question for a moment. Um, okay, what kind of wages are people making in the fields and what are the working conditions? That wants to say, sir? Uh, yeah. they get paid by the pieces. So again, there's a lot of robbery of salaries. When the, uh, for example, the strawberry industry right now in Santa Maria, the worker basically gets paid by the piece or quote by the box that they pick, $1.25. Yet that same box goes for $40 at the market. So there's a lot of exploitation, and that's another way or another loophole that the growers find right. instead of having a salary. How long does it take that work up? We're looking at maybe 12 hours a day where people are literally running. They're doing triathlons in the fields. They're bent over almost 12 hours. They are carrying 25 pounds every five minutes, and they are running from here to where you're going to be speaking at, and then running back. So these are people without um, health care, these are people that are damaging their joints, that are also being um, manipulated. For example, if the grower provides them with any type of, quote, health insurance, it's only a clinic that they are assigned to. When the worker goes and complains about the injuries, the doctors there never find nothing wrong, and they're always sent back to work again. If they use that same insurance to go to any other clinic, they're, they're not valid. So we're asking you to please reinforce those laws. Uh, we're just talking about being more human. And yes, there's thousands and thousands of indigenous Oaxaqueños working in the fields nowadays. That's one of the reasons why the UFW is not supporting the farm workers out there. Let's put it out there, it's honest, it's true. They're also supporting the guest worker program that's putting against the undocumented workers in our fields. So let's not support the guest workers. Uh, because we need to provide a comprehensive immigration law for thousands of undocumented workers okay. right now. Let me ask you a question. I don't know if anybody has to answer. What is your best guess about the percentage of workers uh, in the fields who are undocumented here? I'll say maybe about a good 85%. How many? 85% of our farm workers throughout the state of California are undocumented. Do people think that's the right number? Yes! All right, so tell me if I'm right or wrong, but if I'm undocumented, I really have very little legal powers. Somebody, you're undocumented, I can't exploit you, what are you going to do about it? Right, there's nowhere to go, and then, quote, 
the only union that was supposed to help us has left us out to dry. That's why we're organizing. That's why we're community grassroots organizers that are now taking that job that some of the unions were supposed to do. And that's why we're coming to you. And that's one of the reasons why we're busting our butt just for you too. For example, today in the morning, I was there with you in San Maria and I drove like crazy just to be here on time with you. But also, you know what? Thank you and happy 28th anniversary. We love you. I honestly love you. I went to the car scene. I went to the rally in South Central LA a month and a half ago. On my way back, there was a drunk driver that smashed his car against mine and literally totaled my car. I've been going to therapy three times a week, but I'm still standing and I'm still here and I still got corazón, I still got heart for you. So we love you. I'm a professor at Cal State here in Bakersfield. I'm also from Mexico, and I know exactly what this brother is talking about. I would like to inform you, since you want to know. Right now, throughout the entire Western Pacific region, Triquis and Mixtecos and Zapoteco indigenous Mexicans from Oaxaca. That's right, that's right. And they are, you can find them all along the Western coast from Washington State and into California, and into Baja California. And I want to tell you, Senator Sanders, I came here to ask you this question that this brothers have raised. And that is, the people in Washington State have organized themselves into something called Familias Unidas por la Justicia, United Families for Justice. All of them Oaxaqueños, all of them indigenous, Mixtecos and Zapotecos and Triquis. They went on strike in 2013 and they're still in, on strike fighting for their rights and they are not getting justice. Then, just to show you how global this whole thing is, in Baja California in 2015, last year, 70,000 70, migrants from Oaxaca went on strike in Baja California in a place called San Quintin. And they have been fighting because they get paid six dollars a day for 12 to 14 hour day shifts. They get paid six to seven dollars a day. These are the same people from these communities in Oaxaca being exploited by the same company, which is called Driscoll, Driscoll Company. And finally, our brothers and sisters right here outside Bakersfield, berry pickers, uh, blueberry pickers in McFarland, also Oaxaqueños, also Triquis and Zapotecos and Mixtecos, they went on strike a couple of week, weeks ago because they, their price per piece went from 90 cents per box to 60 cents per box in, from April to May. And they finally got so fed up and they had support from nobody, they walked out. Now the UFW has gone up and tried to help. I encourage you to do two things, Senator, and that's why I'm here. Number one, endorse the international boycott from Baja California all the way to Washington State of Driscoll products. The entire Western coast right now is asking for an international boycott of Driscoll, both in Mexico and in California and in Washington State. And the second thing I, I want to ask you, Senator, is to please raise your voice for a global solution to the immigration issue that takes into account the mobility of labor in our region, which no longer can be denied the freedom that capital has to flow back and forth. Thank you. I will look into, and I should know this and I don't, I've been running all over the place, let me look into the Driscoll thing, but I am very inclined, of half of what you say is accurate. Are you telling me people are working for six dollars a day? Screwing everybody. 
All right. Tresco will hear from you. Let me thank you all, A, for being here, and thank you for your presentations. You have educated me a whole lot, and I will not forget your love and not forget what you have told me today. Thank you all very, very much.